Now to help us focus on the fundamentals behind the technicals, Paul Nolte joins us this morning from Murphy Silvis Wealth Management. Paul, welcome. It's good to have you back on the Future Show. Uh, let's begin with crude higher last week, back to November levels, and not what the inflation hawks want to see. No, that's true. And when you look at the commodity prices as a whole, you look at the commodity complex, the complex has been trend, generally trending higher. So we are looking at uh basically prices back to where they were a year ago so we got that uh inflation help if you will coming from june into oh april may of this year things have kind of turned around we're seeing opec getting a little bit more uh, a little more muscle in the market we're seeing a dollar that has gained some strength after being weak most of this year uh falling since the fall and certainly interest rates here in the United States have uh, have bolstered that as well with interest rates continuing their trend higher. So we're looking at a commodity complex in the very broad sense to continue that strength, even though China can, uh, is, is struggling here. We're seeing some strength in Europe. We're certainly seeing some strength in the United States. We look at the GDP now figures, and we're still looking at 4% plus for economic growth. And that, I think, is going to be supportive of the commodity complex. Yeah, I'd argue a couple of recent draws in inventories, large draws for that matter, in terms of what we've seen, can add to that list of bullish uh, contributing factors. The SPRs, right, at some point, we keep hearing about those, are going to need to be replenished. Uh, that seems to support prices whenever we see a dip. How about the U.S. dollar, though? Because you mentioned the weakness is one of the contributing factors to the run-up, but yet we've seen it strengthen recently with some of the weakness in the pound, the euro, the yen, for example. We're going to take a look a little bit later on about how the Australian dollar also, I mean, multiple foreign currencies are coming under pressure. And I think that really comes back to the relationship between the dollar and interest rates. Okay. You know, we've seen interest rates pick up. Uh, we are now in a regime where the U.S. is leading the world as far as interest rates going higher. When that's the case, we tend to see dollars strengthen. Uh, we saw uh, Europe, we saw other countries being a little bit more aggressive toward the tail end of the year, and there was a signal from the Fed that they would be putting on the brakes. Mm -hmm. And that led to dollar weakness from roughly October until early this year. Since that time, there's been more discussion about the Fed staying at very high levels, maybe raising rates through the end of the year, and that has led to dollar strength. So I think really to keep an eye on the 10 year note and take a look at the interest rates. And that I think is going to be pointing to what we should be doing when we look at the dollar. And then by extension, for equity investors, do we invest internationally? And when we have a strong dollar regime, as we've seen over the last three, four months, international investing for U.S. investors. Uh, is, a, is a tough road to go. Yeah, you know, that, that brings up a couple good points that I want to get into, but uh, just quickly, again, in terms of the U.S. dollar complex environment, indeed, because you've got, again, the thought that, uh, well, if the uh, rates are higher here in the U.S., ultimately they're higher for longer environment should fuel the U.S. dollar to connect to it, but we've seen a little bit of a disconnect, right? Rates back to levels that we haven't seen since last fall, yet the U.S. dollar kind of lagging in terms of that equivalent, right, in terms of uh, equivalent levels, yet uh, we we're in a situation where that higher uh, European, European approach towards rates as well and having to be a bit more aggressive maybe is weighing on some of those currencies, kind of bolstering the U.S. dollar here as well. But in terms of do we invest internationally, the question you just raised, that's one of the things I've been talking about quite a bit here because it does seem like some of the weakness in China and potentially some of the weakness in Europe kind of bolsters U.S. stocks in a counterintuitive fashion, right? We talk about competition for investors' dollars. If it's not going off overseas to China and to Europe, in theory, yeah, money market funds here has captured quite a bit of it, but a fair amount of it staying here in the U.S. compared to where it normally would go. No, that's true. And one of the things that we took a look at uh, maybe about a year or so ago is, is a very simplistic model when we take a look at international investing and that is is the dollar strong or not and if it is trending higher you tend to stay away from international if the dollar is mm. trending lower you can invest in international okay. and so that's why october of last year it peaked out we had some weakness for about six months or so that trend has reversed and so that that strength in the dollar really when you look at it is one of the key factors for international investing. So, you know, should you invest internationally? 
They are very inexpensive from historical norms, but you have a huge headwind in the fact that the U.S. dollar is now on, on a strengthening cycle. I'm not quite sure where that ends. It may end when the Fed finally decides that they're done raising rates. If you're looking at the CME now, they're projecting that interest rates can be down a full percentage point by this time next year. We we're not yet in that camp. We still think higher for longer is the mantra. We're actually listening to and believing what the Fed is saying. The equity market to this point and some of the other markets are, have been calling uh, the Fed's bluff here. Yeah, pushing back quite a bit here, but it seems like since the highs that we saw back in July, maybe a little bit more of a sense of realism in terms of approaching uh, uh, that position from Fed Chair Jerome Powell, at least a little bit more accepting of. Let's talk a little bit about rates because we've seen uh, a quite a uh, event here in terms of the yield curve inversion, which is now starting to come back in a little bit here. But what are you watching there and what should we be keeping an eye on in terms of headed into the end of the year and uh, maybe a bit more of a sense of normalcy in terms of what we're looking at the long versus the short end here, Paul? Yeah, you know, the, the inversion of the yield curve, we got down to a full 100 basis points between the 2 and 10. We're now floating around 70. We'd really like to see that positive by about mm -hmm. 30 or 40 basis points. The other market that we take a look at is high yield spreads, and that really gives us an idea of risk appetite. Those spreads are fairly narrow. They're at their most narrow now in over a year, and that's telling us equity investors are very accepting of risks um, and that there is a lack of stress in the fixed income market. So I think from an equity investor's perspective, things are fairly positive. And for U.S. investors that are domestically focused, fixed income investors, I think generally speaking, as we mentioned, the stress levels are pretty low. But that inverted yield curve keeps us relatively short versus the benchmark. So we have been generally going out no more than five years in a lot of our investments. We've stayed away from a lot of the spread product because of those very narrow spreads. So we've been a little bit more focused in the Treasury market. Paul, as the Fed gets closer to the 2% target, should we expect the yield curve to narrow even further? Or is this kind of a reflection of the market pushing back or market's expectations and uh, uh, consensus uh, related to the inflationary pressures? Yeah, to a certain extent, I think. But what you have historically seen, and this is one of the things that's really confounded the markets to this point, is that we've had an inverted yield curve for so long. Yeah. And remember, too, that the inverted yield curve generally has been a signal for oncoming recession. Right. So in order for the Fed to step aside, that means economic weakness. I and mean, I'm not sure that we're going to get a soft landing. It's kind of landing a 747 on an aircraft carrier. <laughs> it's going to really be difficult to do. So I think here we're looking at the potential for a recession, a Fed making a mistake, and that has yet to play out. We haven't really seen it yet in the data. We're starting to see some pockets of weakness, certainly the international markets. We've highlighted China. Those are all factors that come another three to six months or so, we may see uh, uh, more signs of that slowing and a Fed that backs away. And that could spell trouble for the equity markets. The equity markets really do struggle when we get to the end of a Fed tightening cycle. Yeah, Fed Chair Jerome Powell said again that there could be, well, not in his exact words, but uh, suggesting that in order to get inflation down to that level, in order to slow the economy, we might need to see uh, labor conditions weaken here a little bit. And uh, um, let's lastly get a quick thought from you here, uh, Paul, in terms of Beige Book this week. Any insight in terms of the September meeting, or uh, will it answer any questions in terms of expectations? Yeah, we're all kind of data dependent. So every every data point now is that much more important. Uh, I think if we're looking at a lot of the economic data, it is generally pointing to a U.S. economy that is generally on pretty good footing. Mm -hmm. That said, there's a separation. Service side is cooking. Manufacturing is struggling. So when we take a look at the data, we're saying the consumer still is fairly strong. We're not seeing big signs of weakness yet. And I think that's what we're going to find from the Beige Book. And, of course, as we mentioned earlier, we have all the Fed governors chatting it up on Thursday. So we'll get some pretty good insight as to what the Fed is thinking ahead of their quiet period uh, going into the Fed meeting at the end of the month.
Senior Wealth Advisor and Market Strategist at Murphy and Silvis Wealth Management. Paul Nolte, it's always a pleasure to have you here on the Future Show. Thanks for sharing your thoughts on currencies and treasuries. As we begin a holiday shortened week, I'd imagine the U.S. dollar to strength their rates. These are going to be major focal points for investors and traders.